Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here for another More Insights and Strategy podcast, here chronicling the evolution of IBM quantum computing. Jay, it's great to see you. It was awesome to see you in Paris. Here we are talking about research. How are you, my friend? Yeah, it's always good to speak to you. I'm doing well. Looking forward to the conversation. It is IBM's keeping me very busy. I was in Think in Orlando. I was in Paris at your partner network conference. And here we are again talking about research. And it is incredible. Unless you are not paying attention to anything in quantum, there was a huge research paper that IBM came out with. It was published in, in Nature. Can you talk a little bit about the significance when I read through it, it, it seems really, really big. Yeah, so we're, we're really excited about this result. So I think there's been lots of great work in science and quantum computing, but now we're getting to a point where we're starting to do something that we cannot do with classical computing. And so what we showed on this was some type of problem. It's a physics problem, but it's a real problem. And we showed that we could start to look at this problem and use a quantum computer to predict uh, outputs that we could no longer do with a classical computer. So I look at it as like the starting line. We fired that starting gun. And now I'm going to see the next few things that come out. And I think we're entering right. this new phase. Like I call it the phase of establishing utility of quantum computing. I think a phase one was we wanted to establish quantum was cool. Quantum yeah. was people wanted to research quantum. Now we can start to, how do we get useful quantum computing? How do we establish utility of quantum computing? And I think of this as the first step, and there'll be many more, and I'm really excited to see what our community of users and people think about this and what they extend to try different examples as well. Yeah, I'm glad that I saw that, and I'm not even a scientist, but these are a lot of the questions that I get, right? And my superpower is not creating quantum algorithms, right? It's, it's explaining to people and predicting when they can rely on quantum computing or elements of quantum computing, most likely uh, mixed with traditional computing to add value. And it seems like we're on this path and we have a point of, of, of proof here. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, so think of it as the first step, right? So. We've, we've done these great experiments where we've seen quantum effects, we've seen many different uh, published papers, but everyone wants to know, when is it going to be useful? When am I going to see an industry application? I don't think we've got an answer for that just yet, but the first step towards getting that is, when can I do something on a quantum computer that it's difficult for me to do on a classical computer. Okay. And what we've seen here is we've seen that uh, this, this simple calculation, calculate some, some property of a problem which we can describe. It's a, magne it's a magnetization problem. And we say, can we calculate this property? And then we've employed these advanced techniques of dealing with the noise, like error mitigation, error suppression, and that's allowed us to get a result that, that seems to be behaving better than our best classical approximate methods in giving us more accuracy. And so I like to think of it, as I said before, it, we've got a tool. How do we use this tool? How do we actually extend this tool? This is what uh, we need to do, and we need to get more and more demonstrations. And yeah, I look at it as, uh, as I said before, you've, we've launched the race. How do we think of different examples? How do we keep making progress? But this is, the, this is uh, significant in that it's 127 qubits, and it's uh, 60 depth long. And so you think of that as a, like a volume of computational space that we're doing on a quantum computer, and that's really, really pushing us to a limit that it's just not possible to start to think of classical computers to be able to model it. Yeah, that's significantly different from the papers. Important stuff, important work up to this point, but that's fundamentally uh, different. And I'm super excited about it because again, I'm trying to translate the benefit to businesses to, and also to, to reinvigorate investment in, uh, in, in, in quantum. So this is uniquely IBM. I mean, I know, I know IBM has a lot of partners, but how has IBM been able to do this when others haven't? I have read papers that kind of said it was doing what this paper did, but I think upon analysis, it didn't actually do that. I wouldn't want to use the word, I mean, debunked sounds hard, but this seems like the real deal. How is IBM able to pull this off? So, core comes into the hardware. 
we've invested so much time in packaging errors to make our hardware good. And this takes a lot of investment. But then on top of that is, is the theory, is the practice, how to deal with errors. And we combine these two. So what we did is we, we, we ran this, this problem and we actually didn't go and test it against simulators. We actually found a partner and the partner tried to come up with simulators to test it. And it created this nice dynamics between us who are only interested in pushing our hardware and the simulator, our partner, on how they can make improvements. And they're pushing each other against and allowing them to keep making progress. And so the simple answer is the combination of all our efforts. Um, I think the, if I look at the most important, the Eagle processor breaking 100 qubits, the latest, which, uh, the latest revisions to that that brought the coherence, they're the main, main one. And then all the work since 2017 that we've been developing to define this quantity, this proce process we call error mitigation. And so what, what it is is the combination of this theory with this hardware to do something that is starting to enter into this utility phase we talked about before. It's interesting, uh, and I've, I've written this and talked about this before. One of the things that I find unique about the quantum roadmap is, well, first of all, anything that's in research, typically they don't actually have roadmaps. That's, that's a little bit new for me. I mean, there's goals, okay, but not things you put on a slide with dates. And I think, and I've been in this industry over 30 years, first time I've seen a roadmap that continuously has, has hit the dates. And I think I've mentioned that to you at dinner before. It's still, I'm still kind of wondering uh, how this comes together. I think part of this is IBM's commitment to quantum that goes back at least a decade. Uh, but also I think the full stack approach helps uh, as well. And I, I even, you know, you graciously gave me an invitation to Paris uh, for your Quanta Partner uh, Network Summit. And, and there I learned kind of this um, network effect of people working together as a community to learn best practices. So those are kind of the, the things that I, I think are very different aside from, um, you know, the whole stack uh, that you're looking at. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I often say we want to create an industry, not just a business. Obviously, I want to make I want to make a product and make it really well. But as we're going to go forward, and the other announcement that we just made, how we're um, investing towards even a future phase of a hundred thousand qubits, this is our commitment that we want to keep pushing that research, that roadmap. Yeah but to keep pushing ourselves to make these uh, bigger, more powerful quantum computers. And the other th part we didn't touch that I find most a lot of value for me personally from the partner forum, that user feedback. And so we right. always have this tension in everything we do. We have our vision, our roadmap, but how do we adapt, adapt it with what our users are doing? And what I saw at the partner forum we were just talking about is the excitement of these new results and the excitement of the, all these outcomes, what does it mean for us to start to think of applications and how we're going to use quantum computing as we go forward? So uh, we've talked about reduced error rates, uh, um, error mitigation, and over 100 qubit systems. When is, are these capabilities gonna be available to clients? So that's another thing. The system that we actually use to run this paper we already give to our clients. It's one of our systems that our clients already have access to. Yes, internally, because we, we know a lot about our systems, we can use them, I would say, a little bit better. And there is a little bit of gap on how to apply that error mitigation and those techniques. And that's what we're working on and reducing that gap through both better education, but more importantly, I want to make the way you run a quantum computer I call it frictionless, right. but how do I integrate these techniques that we discovered in the research so that they can just be an option for our clients and partners to use it? That takes a little bit of work. You've got to get robust. You've got to get it more productized. So we're working towards that. So today, yes, the clients could go do it, but they would have to go do all the error mitigation, all that themselves. Right. And as we get more advanced in how we can calibrate robustness and all these into the what we call the primitives or the, the fundamental uh, APIs, um, I imagine a future where these are just options and a client can explore different options and we will handle the noise as best as we can 
uh, through, through our software and error mitigation so they don't need to worry about it. And this is what I'm hoping to build out towards this, this sort of future of just easy to use quantum computing such that from the end user, a user just wants to have access to quantum computers, classical computers, and they want them to work. Right. Yeah, it, it is. Everybody wants optionality, and I've seen a lot of research-based quantum computers go through the labs. Um, I also had the, uh, I was told that the privilege, I was one of the first people to walk through a Poughkeepsie, yep. uh, where you actually had production systems the client ha had, had access to. By the way, a security guard was walking within 10 feet uh, from the group I was with, uh, so it must be pretty uh, This system is actually stuff. in Poughkeepsie as well. Okay, yes. there we go. Um, and uh, like I saw at Partner Network, uh, partners out of Japan in the Cleveland Clinic that actually have on-premises capabilities as well. So you add that to the IBM Cloud, the, the ability to get access. It seems like you're not making the decision for your clients, you're letting your clients make that decision or, or help you in that. Yeah, so we, we the Poughkeepsie uh, Data Center uh, I think this is it's our first example of data center. There's like 22 systems there, right. and you could have seen them all laid out. In that facility, we can control the air conditioning. We can control all the stability. So those right. systems are more, um, more, more compact, and so uh, you, you could walk in and you could uh, touch. That's probably why you had the security guards and that following you. Whereas the ones that we've developed for the clients, we put them in a nice glass box. One aspect of that glass box yes. is to look good, yes. but the other, it, it provides security and also the ability for us to control the stability of the system. And so depending on whether our clients want to use in the cloud, which I think is where most value and most clients want to go, they can use our systems over at Poughkeepsie, or if they really want an on-prem system, which is emerging because if you want to start, uh, which is emerging for interesting research questions, because if you want to start exploring classical and quantum working together, maybe you want to put your on-prem next to some classical computing so you can actually start to have them like a lots of the data going between them at the rates you want. You can not be limited by bandwidth and, and things like this. So I'm seeing a lot of excitement, which I call middleware for quantum. Right. How do we make this, this software stack that can talk to both of them? And the other thing that we uh, kind of announced, but we didn't touch on it, is um, we, with this result and this sort of setting this path towards utility, I'm also working towards all the systems we have being 100 qubits or more. So one of the things we want to commit to is now there we're in this new phase, how do we build education on this phase? How do we build um, more use cases once you're in this uh, utility phase? And so I want to move all of our systems that we've had, like we have a few systems that are running uh, billions, of, uh, what is it, four billion executions. They're all like five and say seven and the 27 qubits. I want to move every system right. uh, by the end of the year to over 100 qubits. And that's because we believe so strongly we're in a new phase and we want to see what people in our community can do with them. I love it, and those are systems uh, with the enhanced uh, error, error mitigation? Error mitigation can okay. be built into the primitives, yeah. So I want to go a little bit big picture now. Yeah. So we have systems available with uh, reduced error rates, uh, with error mitigation. We have middleware to connect um, to just about anything, including uh, classical computers. In fact, that's one of the main reasons for it. Um, I see people in your, uh, partners in your ecosystem, just trying to make it easier uh, for clients to tap uh, access here. What does this mean big picture? I mean, this is a big, this is a, this is a pretty big deal holistically, isn't it? I think where, in my view, um, the future of computing is not gonna be without quantum. So future of computing is gonna be accelerators that do different topics. We've all seen the excitement of AI um, over the last few, uh, last well, six months that have come out, uh, a bit less even. But I think of AI as innovation for the future by using the past. So I imagine a future you're going to have AI, you're going to have quantum, but quantum allows us to calculate what we couldn't do. So it brings future calculations, future innovation. So how we combine these two, I think these are open, great areas to look. I think it's the most exciting time to be in computing 
because now it's completely different. And how we use quantum, how we use AI, how we use traditional computing, it's going to be much more driven uh, by use case, by applications, by trying to explore something different. So if I was just getting into computing, I would say right now <laughs> this is the time I would want to start. Obviously, I've been working on quantum for a long time, but how if you jump in and you work out how all these things come together, there's a lot, a lot of potential for the future. So you've created a phrase that I really like. It's called you know, quantum utility, okay? And it's so funny, I was racking my brain when I heard about uh, quantum advantage. This is different from quantum advantage, and I'm, gl I'm glad you're calling it something different because it is different. Can you compare and contrast those two terms? Yeah, so we, we wanted to call it utility because we wanted to, the focus to be on starting to do something useful. Right. And I think the biggest difference between advantage and utility, advantage will apply to some type of problem. I think advantage should come from, from the user. If I'm a I don't know, an industry, a chemist. I've now got a quantum advantage for doing my problem. Right. From us that are providing the fundamentals, we want to provide the tools that have utility. So I think of utility as almost a, a phase or an era. And these machines are getting to that phase. And so now it's, I think, up to our community of users, academic researchers to work out under this set of assumptions or under this set of constraints or under this use case, do you see an advantage of using quantum? But like think of utility as a new era. I think the previous era was about establishing, as I said before, quantum was cool. Yeah. This era is a, of using these processes that are in the utility to look for different use cases where I can get an advantage over classical. And then in the future, we're gonna have, what I, we've talked about it before, but this vision that we have for quantum-centric supercomputing, right. where we're already working on because we want to get to systems of 100,000 qubits, and there's some really tough research <laughs> questions to yeah. get there. But I, I, I like to think of those three phases. And what this paper we're talking about today is like started this center phase. Right. And we need to get many different demonstrations, applications, uses, develop the middleware so we can set ourselves up for this future. So I love that you'd put this in a structured format at least what I've learned is anything that's difficult to explain to anybody helps to have phases. And you talked about phase one being the quantum is cool, establishing it. Talk and, about in the community. And, and, so. and the community, the, the second phase that we're in right now is all about quantum utility. Yep. And what about phase three? What about, what does the future uh, look like again? Can you yeah, extrapolate so, on that a little bit? So. Utility, we'll, we'll st we have to do these things like error mitigation things to deal with it. The future, I imagine, we got full error correction, and it's just like a quantum, a quantum computer is is basically look. You you send your your program, it executes it without errors, and so we need for that level, we need a certain size. We need also that quantum computer to work with uh, classical computing to simplify all that all of that. So I think of three things that are going to enable this future. The first is modularity to allow us to scale. And that's a hardware and even a software statement, but predominantly hardware. If you look at our controls and all these type of things and you ask, can we scale today's controls or today's cryogenics up to that size? There's some engineering scientific questions that we need to overcome. So starting to write them down and showing how you're going to scale to that big. The second is quantum computing and communication quantum communication are kind of being separate fields. But inside your processes, your classical processes, you've got interconnects, you've got processes. So to allow us to scale, we're going to have to bring communication and computation together so that we've got processes connected to other processes with both classical and, communica uh, classical and quantum communication links. And then we need to get this uh, middleware for quantum that we're touching on that allows us to use all these. And I even imagine in this middleware for quantum, using classical computing to do things like more efficient error correction and make it this path from today's error mitigation to error correction. So I think of this phase as quantum-centric supercomputers and I imagine that's going to be a machine that's powerful enough that it's going to be like the largest supercomputers we have today in classical. This will be the next generation of a supercomputer. 
It's a lot of fun. Yes. And, you know, as industry analysts, uh, we're educating the community, bringing, bringing value to it. And it's been a lot of fun uh, being along uh, for the ride for so many years. I think this is either year four or five that uh, I've been crawling. It probably seems like a lifetime to you, but uh, relatively uh, new for me. But it's, it's, it's fun to see the wheel of innovation turning so quickly at IBM and across its its IBM Quantum Partner Network. So appreciate your time. Thank, thank, thank you. you for meeting with me on the big day. No problem, thank you. This is Pat Moorhead with more insights and strategy, uh, thanking everybody out there. You can learn more about this groundbreaking research paper uh, that came out today. Check out our show notes, and I'm sure we're gonna be doing a write-up on uh, the more insights and strategy website. Thanks for tuning in uh, wherever you are on the planet. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Take care.